This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. So there's a saying, you've probably heard it. Be careful what you wish for, lest it come true. It comes from Aesop's Fables. It was written around 260 BC. And I thought tonight, let's put it to the test. It's 2020. How do we know if it's still true? Right? And that's a particularly pertinent question because I recently came into possession of this. Now, if you aren't familiar with the Infinity Gauntlet, let me just explain how this baby works. So you see those, um, let's see if I can get the thing to work. Uh, no, all right, it's not that magical. Um, <laughs> so you see those stones there? They're called Infinity Stones. You bring them all together in this magical gauntlet. And when you snap your fingers, you can make anything happen. Anything. Now, I'm going to explain how we're going to use this in just a moment. But before I do, while we're on the topic of supremely powerful beings, uh, I want to say thanks to Ken Ford uh, for having me here tonight. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, the origins of this talk actually started here at IHMC when Ken and I hosted a blue sky on the future of work and answering the question, what would we like the human experience of work to be? And that's a really important question for me because I've been a coach, uh, a career and business coach for the last nine years. I've worked with people all over the world from all walks of life, so from the recently unemployed all the way to corporate and government executives and really everybody in between. And what that experience taught me is that humans are amazing. They are capable of such great work. And I found myself continually frustrated at the way society chronically underestimates people and in turn causes them to chronically underestimate themselves. And I've really dedicated my life to uh, liberating human potential at scale and opening up professional and economic mobility to those who might have their talents otherwise unrecognized. Now the at scale is an important part there, right? So I've, I've done this already um, for hundreds of people and now I wanna do this for tens of millions. Hence the gauntlet, <laughs> right? That's a, that's a much bigger order. So I found myself wondering what would happen if I gave everyone in America a college degree who doesn't already have one. And not just any college degree, a STEM degree. Hmm? Pretty exciting, right? Um, now, I thought maybe before I snap my fingers, I would just do a quick gut check with you guys here in the room. I'm, I'm still a little new to world changing, kind of makes me a little nervous. Um, so, if we could just do a quick show of hands, if you think this sounds like a good idea, let's give everybody in America a college degree, a STEM degree, and will this go a long way towards alleviating things like income inequality, economic mobility issues? Wow! We have a lot of education skeptics in the room. I was not anticipating this. <laughs> Wow, okay, well, as it turns out, um, I did a little research before I came, and our skeptics are right to be concerned. Smart people. So it turns out that this experiment has been going on for the last 80 years. We've already done it. So back in uh, the end of World War II, there was a big push to expand education nationally, aided by the creation of the GI Bill. So we went from having just 4% of the population have a college degree or higher to today having 40%. Uh, at the same time, we've had a significant decrease in the number of college dropouts, and a lot more people get exposure to college education, even if they don't leave with a degree. This is a phenomenal success when you consider how much the population has grown over that same time period, right? Huge success story. Great, so what, what's the result? What happens? So this is a graph that shows you how the composition of the workforce has changed over that same time period. So 
that gray line, does this work again? No, no. That gray line indicates the same time frame that we saw for the education data starting in 1940. This is from Richard Florida at the Martin Prosperity Institute. And what you can see is he's divided the workforce into three different classes based on industry. So the blue line here represents the working class. So these are folks who work in manufacturing, construction, transportation. The red line is the service class. These are folks who work in things like food and beverage service, retail sales, uh, clerical and administrative work, that kind of thing. And then the black line is what he calls the creative class, which is essentially everyone else. Um, it's a pretty broad group, right? So this is everybody from your local mural painter to teachers and nurses all the way up to your corporate executives. So I've shown here the average salary for each one of these classes on the right-hand side. Bear in mind, though, that that creative class is huge, so the spread on that average is also huge. So there's a couple of things I want to point out. The first is that the service class composes 50% of our workforce. Does that surprise anybody? Anybody find that surprising? Stunning. You guys are so smart. What am I even doing here? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so 50% of our workforce works in the service class. The other thing that is an important thing to note here is that just because you're more likely to have a college degree in the creative class doesn't mean that your job requires one. So 40% of the workforce has a college degree or higher, only 26% of <coughs> jobs actually require one. Yeah. So what that means is if we were to do our little educational finger snap, right, we wouldn't actually have much of an effect because there simply aren't enough good paying jobs to go around. And let me just give you an example of how this plays out. So I had a neighbor, uh, interestingly enough, also named Jen, we're everywhere. Um, and she said uh, she had gone off to college at age 16, really bright young woman, um, and very quickly realized that although she was intellectually prepared for college, she wasn't really emotionally ready. So she had to drop out. Like a lot of people who drop out of college, she went into the service class because those are the jobs that are open to you. Um, and she got lucky. She got a job in sales. She did really well. She rose up through the ranks and found herself the regional sales manager for a diamond company. And then the recession hit. And if you know how this normally works, those who work in uh, luxury sales are often the first to get laid off, which was the case for her. But she wasn't worried. She said, you know what? This is a perfect time for me to go back to school and finish that college degree. So she did. She went back to school. She got a degree in public health with a um, specialty in biostatistics and was ready to chart a new life for herself. But by the time she graduated, the world had changed. So it turns out that there was a glut of public health graduates. And she couldn't find a job without a master's or a PhD. And when she turned now to sales, she found that that world, too, had changed. So now sales had become much more technical. They all had technical sales and software platforms that they were using. And they really wanted someone who had expertise in their platform. And she tried to tell them, I can learn how to use your platform. What I understand is sales. And she finally got someone to give her a chance, but it involved moving across the country and taking a 40% pay cut. So here's somebody who did all the things that you're supposed to do. She got a college degree. She got a STEM degree. And she's still back in the service class earning less than she did before. Now, it's easy to imagine bad luck, bad timing, right? That's just, that's just one story. But when we look at the results of this 80-year experiment, what we find is a pretty mixed bag. There are now 44 million borrowers who owe 1.5 trillion in student loan debt. In 2018, half of US colleges saw a majority of graduates earning less than $28,000 a year. I'm not even gonna ask if that surprises you anymore. I'm just assuming you know all of this, <laughs> right? If you don't go to college just to earn a lot of money, but there is kind of an assumption that you're going to have a return on investment in soon, especially when you're carrying a lot of debt. Part of the reason they're not earning much is because 75% of jobs added since 2009 pay less than $50,000 a year. So $50,000 a year is roughly that threshold that you need to cross to get into the middle class. 
And as a result, the chances of earning more from your parents went from 90% in 1940 to less than 50% today. So over the course of our big education ex experiment, what we found is that we've actually moved backwards in economic mobility. And one of the reasons I think that this happens is because we really don't understand complicated and complex problems. Anytime we're trying to solve a big societal problem, we've really got a complex problem on our hands. We're used to complicated problems where we know what the problem is, we can break it down into small independent problems, solve them independently, integrate them back together, and we know if we're right. Did we get the answer right or wrong? A great example of this is putting a man on the moon. Right? That was a very, very difficult, complicated problem. But we knew what it was. We could have life support, you know, working independently from the fuel guys. And we integrate that all back together, and we know when the man is on the moon. In contrast, a complex problem is often really difficult to even define, because the root causes aren't obvious. You might say, well, is this an education problem? Do we not have the right education? Maybe it's a how much education costs. Maybe it has nothing to do with education. It has to do with how employers are hiring, skills-based hiring, right? So you can walk around there and not really be sure what problem you're trying to solve. You often have contradictory or changing requirements that are being driven by different stakeholders. So you have workers who would really like to have job stability, they'd like to have lots of money, and then you have employers who really want to have lots of profits and drive down costs. And you've got to make both of those work. There's no single solution to a complex problem, and this is where we often get caught up. We really like, if you do A, then you get B. And that's not how it works in complex problems. So this causes us a lot of issues because we don't understand this distinction. And so what this really led me to believe is that if I have dedicated my life, as I have, to liberating human potential at scale and opening up economic mobility, then we need a systems approach. So I partnered with uh, my friends at the Foundation for Inclusion, who are experts in systems mapping, uh, to do that systems analysis. And this allows us to see the structure of the whole system at once. Um, it discover how parts of that system work together to produce those unwanted outcomes, like reduced economic mobility with improved education, and how can we start to fill in the gaps? So this is the story I'm going to tell you tonight. It's the result of a year of research um, trying to figure out why are we seeing these results that we're seeing and what can we really do about it? And I'll say now, I am not an economist. Ken's already let the cat out of the bag. I'm a biochemist. Um, but what I would think of myself as more is a, an economic, a curatorial economist, right? So what we've done is we've taken economic indices, uh, trends, analysis, stories, and we've pulled them all together into a single framework to try and make sense of what's happening and then to try and predict what we can do about it. It was maddening uh, because every time we thought we, you know, we had it down, some new indice would come out and we'd say, OK, does it still make sense? So what I will say is um, if we really got this right, this will seem exceedingly simple and obvious to you. It was not. So please just humor me as we're going along like, oh, yeah. <laughs> So what I'm going to present is, are what we call the four imbalances, jobs, access, skills, and desirability. Again, these are all, when I present each one of these, it should seem obvious. Simplicity is the, the sign that we've got it right. The magic happens and was when you look at the feedback loops within and between each one of these imbalances and how they influence each other to produce those unwanted outcomes. So the first is the jobs imbalance. So this really looks at the balance between the number of workers, people who are ready, willing, and able to work, and the number of jobs. This is what most people think about when they think about the state of the economy. How are we doing? Um, as you probably know, if people and jobs are relatively equal, then we have what's called full employment. That doesn't mean no unemployment, because you have to have some unemployment to give market flexibility, give people the chance to pursue other opportunities. But we have basically been at the levels of what we consider full, un uh, full employment uh, since 2016. 
So when that happens, economists get really excited because what that means, in theory anyway, is that people have disposable income, they use that to spend, 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 that leads to profits, then they create more jobs, and ah, economic growth, right? Everybody's happy. That's what we're going for, the shared prosperity model. The difficulty with the jobs imbalance is that it can hide a couple of things. So the first thing is that there are people who are outside the labor market, right? So they're not, they don't have a job and they're not looking for a job. Now that may be because they don't want one. They might be a parent who's staying at home with the kids, um, or it could be because they've given up on finding a job. But when we actually include the people who are outside the labor market inside that total bubble of people, now the unemployment rate jumps up to 6.9%. So that's roughly another 11 million people that we hadn't accounted for before. The other thing is that some of these jobs are not full-time jobs, right? So you don't know, just looking at unemployment, is are those jobs providing enough hours or enough income to produce that shared prosperity that we're counting on? So in fact, it's turned out that involuntary part-time work has been increasing over this economic expansion, which is somewhat surprising. So that leads us to the next imbalance, the access imbalance. So it's great to have a, a number of jobs matching the number of people, but the people have to be able to get to the job in order for that to work out, right? So if you live in Pensacola and there's an excess of jobs in Jackson, Wyoming, that doesn't do you much good unless you can telecommute. So what ends up being the reality is that Yes, they look equal at the national level, but within a particular location, you can have these imbalances. And this is true for both workers and for employers, right? So when employers are out there looking for people to hire, they may find there just aren't enough people here for us to bring on. By the way, this can be true even within the same city if it's a transportation issue. Right? So even if you don't have a car and you don't have good public transportation, you might have plenty of people in the city, but they still can't get to the jobs. So this makes that jobs imbalance a little bit trickier. The next is the skills imbalance. So here we have to have a matchup between the skills that people have and the skills and qualification that employers are looking for. And so what often happens here, right, is you have employers say, all right, we need people with skill X. Maybe there isn't enough in the population. Um, or in this case, we'll start off with too many people. So those people say, oh gosh, you know, for me, based on where I am and the skills that are required in the jobs that are accessible to me, there's just not enough jobs. I need to go retrain. Um, and, and the employers stop recruiting. A little while later, this is now balanced out the other way. <coughs> Right, so too many people have left, and now we have other people who need to retrain for a skill saying, oh, I know, I'll go learn skill X because there's a lot more jobs than people. And then a few years later, we find ourselves back the other direction. So what you get are these oscillations, and this happens because there's not a good way for employers to signal what skills they really need, if you think about it. Right? Maybe you read an article in the newspaper that says the top 20 hot jobs. Right? Or maybe you come across somebody who says, oh, you know, at our company, we're, we're trying to hire coders. You totally need to go learn how to code. So you get these imperfect signals, and then it takes time for a skilled workforce to grow. So they have to go and actually learn that skill. That can take months or years, and that's if there's even a program available. Right? So sometimes you have to build those programs from scratch. It can take another several months or years. So this produces these oscillations in the workforce. And that's how we get to um, situations like we heard with Jen with the public health degree. Right? We need people who have a public health background. But by the time she graduates, oh no, we don't need any more people with a public health degree. Too bad for you. Right? And so this can actually deter people from getting the skills and education that they need because it rests on the back of the workers. Right? They take all the risk here by investing the time and the money to go get a skill without really knowing for sure if there's going to be a job on the other end of it. So we have our jobs imbalance. That's exacerbated by the access imbalance. It's exacerbated further by the skills imbalance. 
So the last one is the desirability imbalance. And so this really looks at who's more desperate. Is it employers are desperate to hire or workers are desperate to get a job? And depending on how that works out in any particular location based on the jobs imbalance, access imbalance, and skills imbalance, then you have an imbalance here. So we see this, right? The big picture is there's a balance between jobs and people. Everybody who wants a job has one. Presumably, they're happy. So we would expect, under this scenario, that employers would be raising wages. They'd be coming up with all cool perks, improving working conditions, trying to attract those workers, right? But what we know from those other three imbalances is that that's not always the reality. In reality, we have a number of people who are underemployed. We have people who hate their job. Uh, we have a lot of people who can't afford to leave. So one of the things that um, I failed to mention there in the access imbalance is that in the, in historically speaking, workers have migrated where the opportunity is. But that's no longer happening. And so what's happening is that the employers are migrating to where the workers are. So in fact, I think it's 72% of jobs added since 2010 went to cities with more than a million people. According to the last census, that's 10 cities. 72% of all jobs went to 10 cities. So what that does is it drives up the cost of living within those cities. So it makes it increasingly difficult for people who want to get a job who don't have the access to go get them. Right? So it provides this barrier. So what you have, actually, are a lot of undesirable jobs, a few good jobs. You have some fully employed people, right? We also know that there's a lot of uh, part-time work in there. And people who can't get to the, the desirable jobs even if they want it. And so this leads to something called monopsony. Has anybody heard this term, monopsony? I'm so glad I can teach you something tonight. <laughs> so you've probably all heard of monopoly. Right? So monopoly is a concentration in seller power. Right? So you love, I don't know, a bag of potato chips. There's only one store that sells them. That store can really put whatever price they want on them because they're the only people who sell your favorite potato chips. A monopsony is a concentration of buyer power. So in this case, the employer is the buyer of labor. So when you have fewer and fewer employers, you get monopsony. And so what we've been seeing is that you have, A, a lot of merger and acquisitions happening. But due to those other imbalances, you also have fewer and fewer options, right? So as jobs become more and more specialized, there are fewer and fewer jobs for which you are actually qualified. As jobs increasingly go to these mega cities, there are fewer and fewer jobs that are accessible to you if you don't happen to live in them. And so what happens is that they found that the average person only has 2.3 employers available to them. And this means that employers aren't really operating in a competitive market and therefore don't really have to work that hard to entice you to come work for them or to stay. So it allows them to depress wages, to depress working conditions, Right? And they know that you can't leave because there's nowhere to go. So there's an alternative, right? So it's not the only way um, that you can do this. This is Dan Price. He's the CEO of Gravity Payments. And about three years ago, he decided to unilaterally increase the minimum wage in his company to $70,000. This is a Seattle-based company. Very, very expensive to live in Seattle. Um, this was hugely controversial. So almost everybody said, you are going to go out of business. We give you 12 to 18 months tops. Right? There's no way you can afford this. Interestingly, he, af he afforded this primarily by reducing his own salary. So the, um, the spread between the lowest paid person in his company and the CEO became fourfold. Do you know what it is for the typical organization? 432 fold. It's a typical spread between the lowest paid employee and the CEO. 432 times. So three, it's now three years on, and the results are 
Revenues have tripled. Not only is he doing really well, but they opened a second um, location in Boise, Idaho, where he offered the same $70,000 salary uh, for a location that is not nearly as expensive as Seattle. So I think what he shows, right, is that there are alternatives, but we're just not using them. And I'll talk about why that is. All right, so just to recap, we've got jobs, access, skills, desirability. Jobs just tells us if we have enough jobs for the number of workers, uh, but we know that that hides people who aren't in the labor market, and it also hides jobs that don't provide the economic prosperity that we need. We have the access imbalance. Um, either workers can migrate to where the opportunities are, or the employers can migrate to where the workers are, and at least for now, they're migrating to where the workers are, which is driving up the cost of living. We have the skills imbalance. So we know that there's an educational lag, which can sometimes produce these oscillations in the labor requirements, right? And that's normally happening on the backs of workers. So uh, that can actually reduce the incentive for people to go get the education they need. And based on those three, we get to the desirability imbalance. How, who's more desperate, workers or employers, and how do they respond? So let's see how this all comes together in a real life example. So this happened um, less than a mile from my house. I was walking around the neighborhood. My local hospital happens to be really close by, which is handy. Um, and I noticed that the workers were on strike. The local healthcare union was on strike. And I thought, well, that's really strange because there's a shortage of healthcare workers. Why in the world would there be a strike? Um, so it was really interesting. So this is a place called Swedish Hospital. Uh, the local healthcare union had gone on strike. There were about seven hospitals in the region, so there were 7,800 staff members went on strike at a cost of $11 million to the company. When I looked a little further, though, it got even stranger because it turned out that at this particular suite of hospitals, they had 900 vacant positions, two-thirds of which were for nurses, half of which had been open for 60 days or longer. So again, you think, why would they be, why did this come to a strike? This is really, really strange, right? Obviously, they should be desperate for workers under these conditions. So you might say, well, look, maybe they can't afford the union demands. So we looked into that. Turns out the hospital had $980 million in profits for the first three quarters of 2019. They were sitting on $11 billion in cash. And they had just given their executive team 157% raise the year before. Now, that doesn't tell us that they can afford the union demands, right? We don't know what the, the balance sheet looks like. But what this tells us is that this doesn't really look like an organization in financial distress. Furthermore, the hospital had continued to expand and, in fact, had been laying people off. So, in 2018, they gave, they had 2,000 more babies born in their hospitals than in 2015. But over that same time period, they'd only added three nurses to the labor and delivery unit. They had expanded to include 145 more beds, only one additional person to clean and disinfect the rooms. Can you imagine? One of the nurses on the strike line told me, yeah, just so you know, they, don't, they won't hire an official contractor to clean out bed bugs. <laughs> it's like, okay, maybe I need a new hospital. <laughs> so what's going on here, right? So what we see is there's an enormous jobs imbalance, right? We have a lot of jobs that are unfilled. They're going unfilled for 60 days or longer. We see that there's probably an access imbalance. We know that there's a nursing shortage and a healthcare shortage nationally, but it turns out that that's not, it's somewhat regional, right? So the West Coast actually has a far more severe shortage of healthcare workers than elsewhere in the country. Um, there's actually a huge push to produce more nurses that are coming out of nursing school. They've got accelerated programs now. So it's actually projected, this is good news for you, there's gonna be a surplus of nurses in Florida uh, we will still be well in the hole. So there's some sort of access imbalance there, right? So you might also say, can they raise wages and improve working conditions enough to attract those people from other locations? 
hard to know. But what the, what the hospital expansion tells us is that we probably have a desirability imbalance here, right? We probably have an issue of monopsony. And in fact, healthcare turns out to be the least competitive market in the country. There are more mergers and acquisitions going on in healthcare than almost any other industry. Interestingly enough, this is a nonprofit, by the way. And indeed, Swedish Hospital had merged with their biggest competitor in the area back in 2012. So they now own 27 hospitals in the region, including the top four in the state of Washington. So if you are a healthcare worker at Swedish Providence, how many other places can you really go given the jobs imbalance, access imbalance, skills imbalance? Right? There's a hundred different specialties of nurses. The idea that there's going to be an opening for you at any one point in time when you need it, probably not. And so what that means, right? And this is not exclusive to the healthcare industry, by the way. We're seeing this everywhere. Right? Understaffing is part of the model for how you drive revenues and profits. So what does all this mean? I hope what I've been able to convince you is that our biggest issue is that we have a good jobs gap. Right? The biggest problem that we have is there are simply not enough good jobs to go around. So when you hear about not paying enough wages, bad scheduling, right, expanding and understaffing, it's easy to imagine that the reason we have a good jobs gap is because of the greedy corporatists, right? They're just trying to squeeze every last bit out of you. Maybe, but I would argue it's a little more complex than that. There's compelling reason to believe that companies are struggling to compete in this environment. Um, if you think about, remember I've, I've coached on both ends of the spectrum, so I get to hear about some of the things that they're struggling with. And when you think about what they're dealing with, right, on the one hand, they have to produce ever-increasing quarterly profits and shareholders' returns, right? Imagine having your best day, and then the next day having to do even better, and the next day having to do even better. It's relentless pressure, right? And that's true even for nonprofits like Swedish Providence. I have, I've actually worked with a few executives in the healthcare industry. They're under the same pressure to produce profits almost like they're a for-profit industry. At the same time, they are having to operate in an environment that is the most complex, dynamic, interconnected world we've ever dealt with, right? They have to keep up with changing technology. They have to um, deal with you know, the social media environment and the, the public relations disaster that that can come, become at any moment. They've got to become carbon neutral in 10 years and run a profitable country, uh, company, right? So they're under a tremendous amount of pressure, and I think they have reason to be worried, quite frankly. If you look at the average lifespan of a company on the S&P 500, it was 60 years back in 1950. In the early 2000s, it w went down to 20 years. It's now just 10 years, right? Now, part of that is due to a lot of mergers and acquisitions. Um, Part of that is also due to delisting, due to some of those pressures. But a lot of it is because companies are failing. So another interesting fact is that of the companies on the stock market, the top 200 companies have produced all of the financial returns since 2010. The other 3,000 plus companies have actually been losing money. And it turns out that Hiring in the nonprofit world is actually outpacing hiring in the for profit world. So, what that tells me, right, is that companies are struggling. And so, when you're struggling and you have enormous pressure to produce those kinds of returns, you reach for the things that you know will work, like mergers and acquisitions, like stock buybacks, like monopsony. And so, what this tells me is that. You know, our temptation when we see this is to reach for policy, to force companies to do the right thing. And we have to be careful about that if we don't take into account why they're doing these things. So what do we do about that? That is a longer answer than I can produce for you tonight. Um, we have a full report that will be coming out in um, April, and I will be very, very happy to share it with you. Uh, but tonight I'm just going to fill you in on what Work for Humanity's approach is and why we're going this way. We just stood up as a nonprofit last year, so all of this is still in the design phase, but I'm really excited about it. So um, yeah, so 
we start with good jobs, right? We understand that this is the core problem that we're trying to solve. How do we create good jobs? There's a couple of different ways to go about it. You can either upgrade the jobs that currently exist, or you can create new jobs that don't yet exist. There's quite a lot of effort that's going into upgrading jobs. That's actually the Martin Prosperity Institute is where their focus is. So you see things like the $15 an hour minimum wage. Uh, there's quite a lot of work going on to try and get mobile benefits for gig workers, um, those kinds of things. And those are great. I mean, the $15 an hour minimum wage has been amazingly successful, right? We're seeing minimum wage increases across 21 different states and counties. Amazing. But... It comes with some costs, right? We talked about this issue of um, forcing companies to do the right thing if we, if we don't understand why. So let me give you an example. You may remember um, Amazon kind of saw the writing on the wall on the, the minimum wage and decided to uh, get ahead of that and offer all of their workers nationally a $15 an hour minimum wage. But at the same time, um, which they didn't publicize, they took away stock options and bonuses, which actually reduced compensation for several of their employees. And the other thing they didn't mention is that in areas of the country where a $15 an hour minimum wage is quite a bit higher than the local wage, this puts enormous pressure on small businesses, right? So you run the risk of those small businesses going under because they can no longer compete for talent, and now we start that monopsony cycle, right? We've just lost more options for workers in terms of employers. Um, another example is California recently put together a bill trying to um, classify who is a gig worker and who's actually an employee. Um, they were really focused on the kind of DoorDash driver, Uber driver, but they unintentionally put a lot of freelance writers out of work because they didn't understand that that gig worker looks like a lot of different people and operates under different rules. And the corporate folks just said, oh, well, here's a loophole. Um, we, we just won't hire freelance writers for more than 15 contracts, so that way we don't have to classify them as an employee. So our approach is to go the other direction and to create good jobs that don't currently exist. And what we want to do is we want to take this challenge of complexity and turn it into an opportunity for greater corporate resiliency. So what we're imagining here is Suppose you have a chief complexity officer, and he, man he or she manages a team that roves around the organization and goes to help out wherever you have complex issues that are coming up, because you really need people who can go across the organization for complex problems. Or maybe you have uh, innovation centers, and their whole purpose is to reinvent the company of, of the future, to rethink who are their suppliers, who are their customers, who are their uh, partners, right? So somebody who's doing that kind of work, who's meant to be solving complex problems for the company, requires a different kind of education. I realize the irony of doing this whole thing and then coming back and saying, and we're going to create an education program. That's OK. I'm, I'm all right with it. Um, and so what we are looking at this is this agile education, where what we're really doing is we're teaching people how to teach themselves anything so they have the ability to adapt and grow with the company as things begin to change. I think, you know, the old model is in that skills gap, right? I need somebody to do skill X. I need somebody who can already do that. But what they're not thinking about is skill Y and Z, which may not even be possible or knowable at the time of hiring. So to me, the one skill that will never get old is to be a good learner. And so really what we're looking to do is how do we create great learners who can address complex problems? And I think the other issue there, right, is that you cannot deal with all the complexity of the world today only at the top. Maybe in the past. I mean, that was certainly the model, right? The C-suite handled the complexity. They told everybody what to do, and they executed it. You're going to need that capacity throughout the organization. So what that means is that we actually have a skills gap in the leadership. Because I find that they often don't understand complexity either. When I do that complicated versus complex problem, they've never heard of it. So what that tells me is that they don't have the hiring processes, the organizational structures, their incentives 
for handling complex problems throughout their organizations. So we're also putting together an education program for senior leadership and boards of directors to help them understand how to enable and empower their workers to help them with those. And if we get this right, right, because remember, we need to create tens of millions of jobs. Tens of millions. So there's five million businesses roughly in the US. All we need to do, all we need to do, <laughs> is two jobs per business. That's not even counting the nonprofits who probably need four, right? And then we'd have it like that. Did it work? <laughs> I left my gauntlet at home. But if we get this right, right, what we have here is what I call that true opportunity for shared prosperity. Workers get tremendous amounts of personal and professional growth. We get that economic and professional mobility that we say we want, right? So we're looking to do this with folks who are currently working in the service class who have aspirations for a different career. We create good jobs that actually create corporate resiliency, which means they're better able to handle the, the dynamicism and the internet connected world that we're trying to deal with. And when that all happens, the communities that house them also grow, right? So it's that win, win, win. Now, I'm not going to lie, there are days that feels like a tall order, um, even when you have a gauntlet as backup. Um, so I need help, quite honestly. And the good news is that you only need 3.5% of a population to band together to create massive transformation. 3.5%, that's so small. I mean, we're a big country, but let's not focus on that. So you'll notice that um, there were some cards. I want to give you guys some things that you can do when you leave the room to help make this vision happen. The first thing that you can do is when our report comes out in April, share it with people. We really need to get the word out, right? We need people to have a better picture of how the labor market really works. Because if you care about poverty alleviation, if you care about um, education, if you care about economic mobility, you can't solve the problem unless you understand the system that you're working within, right? So if you know people who are working in economic development, poverty alleviation, all those things, share it with them. Share the, the copy, uh, the video from this talk. Get the word out. That would be great. Um, if you are an employer or you work for one um, and you are interested in having training either to develop that agile workforce or for your leadership, let me know. Check that box and we can talk about what that might look like. If you can help connect us to funding, that would be much appreciated. All the work that you saw tonight, and, and much more actually, um, was entirely funded out of my savings account. That's how much I believe in this work. Um, and to be honest with you, I would be very tempted to fund the rest of it, but I love being married. <laughs> So um, if you would, we had 20 years this year. So if you could get us another 20, that would be amazing. Um, and then finally, if, if you ever feel like there's nothing you can do about these issues, because I think all of us want to fix these problems. I don't think there's anybody who says, eh, I'm OK. Right? I, I, I just don't believe that. And if you ever forget how powerful you are, I'll send you the gauntlet. <laughs> it's the least I can do. You are welcome to check as many of these boxes as you want. Fill in your name and email legibly, and there's a basket in the back. Does anybody know where the basket is? Okay. So there's a basket in the back in the other room. Put those in there, and I will get in touch with you within the next week or two. Okay? And, and why does this matter? You know, I think sometimes we forget this idea of, equal opportunity, it's named after our country, yep. right? This, this phrase, the American dream, uh, was coined in 1931 by James Truslow Adams. And he said, I, I dream of a land where life is richer and fuller and better for everyone, where opportunity is accorded to everyone by achievement and ability. I think that's worth fighting for. I think it's worth creating. 
But I would add to it. First, I think that given the right mindset, skill set, and opportunity, almost anyone can do almost anything. And I think we will rise together or we will fall together. So we have a choice to make. So what I would say is let's make sure we create the American dream together. Let's go do it. <laughs> Are we ready for questions? I'm ready for questions. Uh, I have Please, right down here. She's so excited. Oh, yeah. I love excitement. In the beginning and when you went over the, you know, who did what or what, I have friends that are in the electrical business, in the plumbing business. We are training young people today to be airplane mechanics, auto mechanics. These are jobs that are so necessary and need to be filled. They don't need a college education mm -hmm. to do that. And I know plumbers make great money. Mm -hmm. And the, my friend who is a plumber, he tries to hire people. He tells them, you stick with me, you will be a master plumber in so many years. You know how long they last on the job? Three days. <laughs> because the work is hard. Yeah. People have to be prepared to work hard. He enjoys his job. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm finished. Well, another thing. Those, those nurses. Was there, was there a question in there? No. <laughs> the nurses that you, that you they yeah. were on strike, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They were unionized. Mm -hmm. That's a benefit because those of us nurses here in Pensacola, if you mention the word union, you get fired. Yeah. So there has to be some more balance in there. Don't you agree? <laughs> <laughs> Love how you stuck that in. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, the, absolutely, right? I mean, I think the big um, takeaway message is there has to be more balance, and we have to find a way to do that, I think, in a way that employers see the benefit, right? We're lucky Dan Price just had an epiphany and said, you know what, I think we can make this work for all of us. We need more employers to get there, and I think we need to show them what's possible, right? It's too easy to write off Dan Price's story as an anomaly. So part of the reason we want to do a pilot program where we take people and we create that entire pipeline for folks, right? So we, we take folks who want to you know, do something different, but they don't necessarily want to go get a college degree. We train them and give them an agile education, and then we create jobs for them that didn't currently exist, and we put them in those jobs. And what we really want to do is show people what can happen in those organizations when you do that, while also training the leadership, right? So the more times I can say, oh, you, pr you probably know someone who's done this, and their revenues tripled too, and they opened a second location too. When we do that, I think we will turn the tide on a lot of this monopsony. Yeah, what, um, to, to me, I see uh, one who's a senior adult and with a long career, a, a, a change in mindset, shall we say. Uh, I would say that my grandfather, my father, and myself, we all stayed in the same area mm -hmm. to, when we retired, we had a very comfortable situation. Yeah. For ourselves. And I see people now, young people, moving from job to job to job to this area, that area, and not staying in something very long. And I'm wondering how this is going to play out for them when they get to be of age, you know. What do you think? Hmm. That's a great question. So, first of all, one of the things that's interesting is that the statistics show that job hopping among the youth is not actually as prevalent as we think it is. So it may be larger than when you were in the workforce or when I was earlier in my career, but it's actually not that large. The second thing I would say is that this is where the desirability imbalance comes in, right? So part of the reason people do switch is when they get that opportunity, if they don't like their job, they move. And what we're finding is that there are a lot more people who don't like their job uh, for all sorts of reasons, right, which, which we touched on in, in that imbalance. So, 
you, there's a, right, that, that's part of the balance, right? If we want people to stay in their jobs longer, we need to make it a job worth staying for. And I think we have lost a lot of that. And, and so, uh, you know, what I find when I coach people, nobody wants to change jobs. They, they change jobs because they feel like they have to. Uh, now, some of that, I will say, is that I find that people have a much broader set of interests than maybe even I did as a kid, right? I mean, sometimes I have clients who are just like, Jen, I love everything. Yeah, why can't I find a job that lets me do everything? And I'm yeah. like, well, <laughs> yeah, you know, we're working on it. But um, so, and I think that's a good thing, right? And, and so some of that is also expectation management to say, and what I often say to my clients is you don't have to do everything at once. So go get you know, your job that allows you to do this, and then if you want to go do this other thing later, you, you'll actually bring a lot of perspective and, and interesting skills to that new job. So it's not always a bad thing to switch jobs as well. That's part of what gives us that corporate resiliency. Time for one more question. Oh my gosh. Um, just a comment on, on an old TV show, and it happened to be Lou Grant, if you go back that far. Yeah. His subordinate came in one day complaining about how he really didn't like his job and this and that, and Lou turned to him and he said, that's why they call it work. <laughs> but um, the, the, the question that I have is that there are a lot of movements around nowadays and some legislation been passed to raise the minimum wage to $12 an hour or $15 an hour or more. Where, where does that fit into your world? So here's what I would say. It, it's, it's great where you can make it happen, right? So Seattle has been doing the $15 an hour minimum wage for some time. Again, there were all of these predictions about how many businesses were going to close. Um, that is... Well, one, we didn't see a lot of businesses close. There's still some debate about whether it's better or worse for workers in the end. That data is not 100% clear. Um, what I would say is I think we've had a long time of corporates having huge profits, uh, executive leadership having huge salaries on the backs of their workers at the bottom of the workforce. And I think that's wrong. Now, I will also say I have a number of friends who own small businesses, right, who don't have the economies of scale that Amazon has, right? And it's very difficult for some of them to accommodate those minimum wage increases. So I think we have to be careful about trying to legislate and force good behavior, right? Um, and, you know, I think what we also know from the unions is that we don't normally get there just out of the goodness of people's hearts if the system incentives aren't right. So that's why you need a systems approach. And, and I think that will involve us really having to look at the incentives. I mean, we didn't fully do that here. But if the incentives encourage people to do monopsony, that's what they'll do, right? I don't actually think most corporate executives are bad people. They're just responding in the way that is logical based on the way the system is designed. On that note, let's thank our speaker. <laughs>